Good afternoon. It's 2 o'clock in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm George Daniels at the University of Alabama, and I am head of the Minorities and Communication Division of AEJMC. Welcome to this very first virtual event of the Minorities and Communication Division. We are excited to team up with the Public Relations Division for this special opportunity to provide faculty support as they are getting ready for a very unusual fall semester. What's not unusual is the commitment that we have in AEJMC to diversity, equity, and inclusion. In fact, the Minorities and Communication Division has been working in this area since really 1968 when the Coordinating Committee on Minority Education was established, the predecessor of the Minorities and Communication Division. And one of the goals of that committee was to address the incorporation of mass communication material on the role of minority groups in America. Well, it's 50 years later, in fact, 52 years later, and we're still trying to accomplish that goal. We're trying to accomplish that goal in the midst of a race reckoning that is changing really all parts of the world, but especially for those of us who prepare mass communicators. Today, we want you to get an opportunity to learn about some things that you can do in your classroom, but also recognize this is an opportunity for you to ask questions. At this time, I want to recognize and introduce Dr. Candace Parrish from Sacred Heart University. She is the chair of a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee of the Public Relations Division. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so that much. Thank you, Magdivision, and to George for having me here today. Um, I am so delighted to join this conversation and webinar. I, as you said, come from uh, the PR division. And um, this year we started up a new committee, the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. And this committee seeks to serve PR, education and academia first within our uh, division. And then secondly, within the area and the field of PR education. And then after that, we hope that our work will have impact on uh, the PR field. Um, so we, were, we are so delighted to be a part of this discussion today. Very, very important. Lots of great tips will come of it. I would like to go ahead and introduce our um, host moderator for today, Dr. Dorothy Bland. And uh, Dr. Bland is a professor at the University of North Texas. She got her PhD from Florida State University. And among so many other accolades, she is an award-winning journalist. So we are so happy to have her insight and her moderation and guidance in this discussion today. So without further ado, I welcome Dr. Dorothy Bland. Thank you, George and Candace, for that very, very kind introduction, as well as the AEJMC Minorities and Communication and the Public Relations Divisions for collaborating to help bring us this Scrub Your Syllabus webinar. I also like to reach out and thank the more than 110 people representing 67 universities who registered for today's webinar. Uh, a few housekeeping details before we get started. Uh, this is a reminder that this webinar is being recorded, and I will be monitoring the chat. So feel free to jump in with questions and comments. Please don't say or write anything that you don't want to go viral. If you're tweeting, please tag at Room Center, at MacAEJMC, or at AEJMC underscore PRD. And remember, our hashtag, scrub the syllabus. Now, George alluded to earlier how different this summer has been. And Lord knows it is certainly unforgettable. But I also want you uh, to be reminded that we are in the middle of the census um, and we're gearing up for a national election. So if you know folks who have not participated in the census, please encourage them to do so. And by all means, ensure people are registered to vote. Um, when I think about what's going on in the nation today, it's increasingly diverse. And for example, I'm, I'm proud to share that San Diego State University is a Hispanic serving institution uh, in a majority minority state. And we have something in common here in Texas because we're also a majority minority state and UNT is a Hispanic and minority serving research one university. So enough about sort of history. Let's talk with our panelists from San Diego State University who have a wealth of experience and tools to share. Our first panelist is Dr. Kay Sweetser, a public relations professor 
and an accredited PR professional and director of the Glenn M. Broom Center for Professional Development and Public Relations. She has more than 20 years of public relations experience and more than a decade in the classroom. Dr. Sweetser is a prolific scholar and her research agenda focuses on how practitioners use digital media. Since 1996, Dr. Switzer has been practicing military public affairs, first as an active duty enlisted Navy communications specialist, and then as a commissioned Navy public affairs officer. She's battle tested as a public relations practitioner, and she served as a mobilized reservist at the headquarters for the war in Afghanistan for seven months in 2011. Thank you for your service, Dr. Switzer. And for those of you who like to count awards, she's worked on three different Silver Anvil teams, which is PRSA's highest honor. So welcome, Dr. Switzer. Our next panelist is Dr. Nathan, Nathan Rodriguez. He's an assistant professor of digital media in the School of Journalism and Media Studies at San Diego State University and part of the core faculty for digital humanities and global diversity. He specializes in critical cultural and digital media studies. His research focuses on minority representation in media, especially LGBTQ and Latinx portrayals and the intersectional identity negotiation, as well as pop culture, radio broadcasting and issues of masculinity and masking. Dr. Rodriguez also has a decade of professional radio experience and on-air talent, sales promotions and social media marketing. So panelists, welcome again, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, let's get started. Kay and Nate, with COVID-19, we're all in our houses and doing more cleaning, although I have to confess, I do have some dust bunnies here. So what does scrubbing the syllabus mean to you? Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and start, because I've been really putting this uh, uh, phrase out there on social media. And, you know, I, I think there are probably a lot of people on this call right now that are middle-aged white women, just like me who are not racist, but we have really sort of fallen asleep at the wheel and we have let our houses get out of control. Things have gotten um, beyond uh, a state of um, the way that we can live in them and we are now um, frustrated and we need to take action and we need to clean house. And for me, that means stopping that, um, you know, just general type of I'm going to walk through life and not pay attention to all the things that are happening and really paying attention um, and dealing with issues of systemic racism, of ensuring that I'm pushing back and um, being an ally when I can and um, really just taking charge and saying to myself that um, you know, this moment is not one moment in time. This is the moment that I looked at the state of my, of my house, of my classes, of my syllabi, and I realized that I was not properly serving my students, in, especially at an HSI, in the way that I could. And so I'm going to ensure that moving forward, there will never be a semester like spring 2020 was, or any semester like that before. It will all be this fall 2020, very deliberate, uh, full of representation type of movement forward. And so for me, scrubbing the syllabus is about um, a rebirth and cleaning and never letting it get this dirty again. Thank you for sharing. Nate, your perspective so, on scrubbing the syllab syllabus? Yeah, so my intersectional identities are quite different than, than Dr. Mm -hmm. Swinkers obviously identify as a queer scholar of color. Um, I'm brown, I'm queer, I use the pronouns he, him, el, and so for me, diversity, equity, inclusion is part of who I am. It's ingrained in my very existence. I cannot separate research, teaching, service, and my personal life because all of it is one in and of itself. So for me, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion work is what I do all the time in all aspects, especially in my pedagogy. And so it's messy, it's dirty, it's all over the place. And for me, scrubbing the syllabus means coming to the point where 
the semester starts in just a couple of weeks. And I need to come to a place in my syllabus where I lock down the readings that I will be using, um, the people that I'll be inviting to guest lecture, and what examples I'll be using for students. So for me, it's about taking all that diversity work that's, that's messy, that is all over the place, and putting it in one organizational document that's living, by the way, right? Because we always have to be able to respond in real time to the socio-political atmosphere and the needs of our students and one another, um, and be able to have that ready for uh, the fall semester coming up. Okay, um, we have a variety of folks in the room today. Some are teaching uh, small classes, some people have large classes. Kay, I'm gonna go back to you and ask, can you give us an example of an exercise that you can do for a small class versus large class? Absolutely, I mean, I think there are ways that you can have the um, overt representation as well as the more subtle type of representation. Um, so I'm gonna take a moment here and, and give you a screen share on some of the um, tools that the Broom Center has spent our summer um, working on. And uh, when you come to the Broom Center website, um, we'll start with the overt um, options. And this is really well suited for the large classes. And many of, many of you told us that you were teaching large, class, large classes. When mm -hmm. you come to what we do on the Broom Center site, you can go to the Broom Center Speakers Bureau. And this is a project that um, we undertook um, with the inspiration and partnership of Professor David Brown at Temple University to go out into the world and say, um, hello, fantastic practitioners from communities of color. Would you like to be a guest lecturer in any of our classes? And would you make yourself available? And so all of these people who are listed on here have made themselves available to be your guest lecturer, which is a fantastic opportunity. And so I strongly encourage you to come here and take advantage of this. Um, and uh, I, it's not perfect and we're still working out some bugs in the way that it's um, it is, uh, shown. But if you have any issues or problems or suggestions, you can definitely email me. Um, another example would be um, more of what I would consider sort of a, a subtle way um, to get a across two folks and that would be in a small class um, and in that particular example um, I would have you working on um, a for me like a writing class um, it would be working on a small writing assignment for my students where um, you are pretending as if you are going to go out and to get an interview um, at uh, some organization and, you're, and you know who's going to be interviewing you. Now me as the professor, um, I have total control over who I can say the interviewer is. And so as, as the professor, when I put forward um, fantastic role models from communities of color who are at the top of their game, um, and, and then the students can see, oh my gosh, I could be just like uh, these fantastic folks. Um, and as they get to know them, they, they um, make more connections and they can see the similarities um, between what it is that the student has in his or her experience and background um, versus what that professional has and, and how many more similarities there are, I think it, become, it can become a, a big inspiration point um, for our students. And so um, those are, are two of the ways in a, large assign in a large class as well as in a small class that you could use um, some of the tools that have been made available um, to create representation. Can you guys hear, Doctor? I can't hear. Nate, are there examples that you'd like to share as well? Um, yeah, I think all of the participants should have received um, a Spark page that I created. And um, well, screen sharing is disabled, so I can't share it with you at the moment. But if you look down the Spark page, there are a couple of examples that I have put. I operate from this kind of rapid, uh, critical, uh, pedagogical state in which I'm always trying to instigate critical knowledge, get students to think, but also to challenge and to ask questions back. And so on that Spark page, if you scroll down um, kind of halfway, there are a couple of case studies that um, are being, oh, there it goes. <laughs> there are a couple of case studies that I have put in there with Starbucks, Pepsi, and um, Nike. The first one with Starbucks, um, on the heels of the Black Lives Matter movement, they, um, at first made a decision through an internal memo for um, their employees not to be able to wear Black Lives Matter 
um, clothing or buttons or anything. And because of that, a lot of people pushed back on it. They came back and reversed their decision and not only allowed uh, their um, employees to wear anything with BLM on it, but they also started producing their own BLM uh, t-shirts with uh, pro uh, proceeds from the profits going to um, BLM organizations. And so it's a perfect example for a case study to look at corporate social responsibility and also looking at how messages are crafted, right, that are sometimes done in a position of power where marginalized voices are absent, right? So it's about looking at campaign creation, looking at the campaign itself, and then what happened afterwards. I also included some information there also about their transgender um, inclusive commercial that can also be used as CSR. Um, the Pepsi, uh, PepsiCo also has two controversial commercials. One is with Kendall Jenner, where she's giving the Pepsi back to uh, the line of police. And a lot of people, you know, read that, especially in today's social political climate, even at the time when this was happening in 2017, that it was just, you know, it missed the mark. And it was something that was not very um, conducive to helping the political social climate that was happening at the time. So looking at the response from Pepsi, looking at the response from Kendall Jenner, and looking at that also through a, a CSR lens, or even through, you know, who's in the room may making these decisions. Somebody had to see that commercial and say, yes, put that commercial out, right? So again, using these as examples of case studies to not just look at crisis communication, look at CSR, but look at how your words matter and what are you crafting. Instigate this dialogue and ask students, what would you have done differently? How could we uh, mitigate this? Uh, in hopes, right, that those students that are going to take all of this critical knowledge that they're creating and recreating and be able to, when they go out into the professional world, craft more inclusive and equitable advertisements, PR campaigns, uh, mediated representations in terms of television shows. I also include a couple of commercials here, some with very bad intersectional representations or lack of intersectional representations, um, but also um, commercials that have uh, a couple more, I think, on the positive side. You can also use memes. I'm really big at using uh, meme generators and have students, after they read different content about um, uh, different types of isms, they are able to take the memes and craft a response to it. So they make counter hegemonic memes, uh, counter misogynistic memes, counter racist memes, and be able to talk about creating those things and how they can craft more inclusive type of messages itself. So for me, pop culture pedagogy is being able to take different types of uh, pop culture media and examples and use them in the classroom to help students bridge those theoretical and uh, those three those theoretical and academic types of readings and theories and bridge them with more pragmatic professional applications and i find that in the classes where i've been doing this students are able to better connect the knowledge and then they start asking really important questions not just about what does that theory mean and, and who, what does this book mean but why is that commercial play on television what is happening at the super bowl what is happening you know in in this social political environment so pop culture pedagogy for me has been a way to instigate that critical pedagogy uh, that has been lacking i think in, in a lot of different academic spaces Thanks so much, Nate. Lots of great information here. One of the things that I also want to go back to is one of the conversations that's brewing, um, and actually this came up at AEJMC last week, was the business of decolonizing curriculum and the academy. What does that phrase decolonization mean to each of you? Uh, for me, it is about um, making sure that there's representation available and that, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, open about the, the situation that I am in, in, in trying to um, grapple with how I can best be there um, to support people uh, who have had their entire lives um, lived under systemic racism. Um, and so for me, I'm, I have really been thinking this summer about what can we do to show representation. And, um, you know, embarrassingly, when I looked at my own graduate course syllabi, um, I counted up, uh, of course, I have diversity in there, um, Latinx being an HSI, as well as um, Asian American um, and Asian scholars. Um, but when I counted up the number of black scholars that I had assigned as readings for my students um, in my graduate research methods class, I had zero. And, and that, that is a big wake up call for me and a problem. And so one of the projects that um, I undertook this summer uh, was a tool that you may have heard about um, uh, online called the, um, the Black, um, the, I'm sorry, the, the Black Mass Comm Scholars data, data set. And so you go again to the Broom Center website under what we do, and then you go to Mass uh, Comm Scholar Search. 
And in here, I have gone through and found um, more than 50 black mass comm scholars out there in the world, and I'm nowhere close, um, but it's me, uh, you know, um, by my candlelight every night trying to put names in, um, and more than, um, or I'm sorry, nearing 400 journal articles. Um, and so what I have done here is not only made it easy for myself um, to find different scholarship um, that focuses um, uh, or that, that is by a black mass comm scholar um, so that I can incorporate it into my syllabus, but then I can also share it with my peers who are just as busy and um, you know, have so many things to do and, and may kind of be in that messy house like I am where they need to scrub the syllabus. And so this is a quick and easy tool that will allow you the opportunity to go in and very easily find um, some black communication scholars so that you can incorporate them into your syllabus. So I went from zero out of 20 readings um, with uh, black mass comm scholars to this semester in fall 2020, uh, 13 of 21 readings, I think it was, um, will have black scholars represented. And so um, I have made efforts to not only incorporate some, um, you know, different types of research that uh, really overtly talks about diversity and, and the scholars have focused on diversity, but then um, also just really great, amazing um, scholarship that isn't about a diversity topic and just happens to be by a fantastic, brilliant black mass comm scholar. And so um, I think this is one of the things uh, that we can also do with this. And um, I know that this is a, a little bit clunky to work with right now. Um, and so I encourage you to also look at um, the Excel spreadsheet if that's easier. And um, let me know who's missing. If you'd like to add anybody, you can do that. Um, but it, it's really an opportunity for us to um, ensure that we don't have that excuse anymore. And um, I know that there's another project um, through the MAC uh, division as well. And I'm wondering if um, George would like to talk about that. Yes, the uh, eyesight project is something that we have going on in the MAC division. The one requirement we have, though, is that that is for members of the MAC division. If we might go back for a moment, Kay, we already have a question in the chat. How does one get his or her name added to that list? I, I am excited to see one of my colleagues here in Alabama use as an example, but uh, I know we have some other African-American scholars who want to be on that list. Absolutely, and Dr. Brown was like the, the far and away most prolific scholar, I think, out of the entire database. I mean, I kind of got tired type, typing his name, I must say, because uh, he has published so many great journal articles. Um, so the one thing is that these are um, specifically journal articles because it is meant to be for graduate um, mass comm uh, classes, and that's that's traditionally what we would be able to assign as a reading, and so so it doesn't have book chapters and things like that. But I'm going to go ahead and put a link in the chat where you can either add um, uh, your own works, or if you like, you can send me a DM for the Broom Center, um, or you can send me an email um, on my SDSU email and just tell me your name and give me your Google Scholar, um, and then I will add you to the list and, and start to go through. Um, this is not meant to put the work. Um, on black scholars to, to have them promote themselves. Um, this is a labor of love uh, that I am investing my own time into. Um, and so if, if you're like, I really don't have time to get my name on here and I, I really don't wanna fill out this form, um, then you don't have to, I will do it for you. I mean, it won't happen as quickly, but we will get you in there. Um, and so I'll put a link um, to how you can submit via a form. I'll also put in the link and I'll tweet out as well here in a minute. Um, how you can look through the Excel spreadsheet, which for me, when I was building my syllabus was easier because I, there were, you know, I wanted a content analysis so I could just do a search on content analysis to find something. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's the website version that I showed you. We do have a follow up I think it's appropriate to throw in here. Mm -hmm. And this uh, person, Jasmine Roberts, asked, how do we go beyond just picking simply citing the work from scholars of color to actually engaging in this work so that it serves as a framework for our classes and that it challenges our ways of knowing. Any thoughts about that? So I think particularly for me, I myself identify as a scholar of color. So of course, inclusion doesn't always equal representation. And I think being this so, so close to where the semester is starting, right? 
a lot of this is kind of where do we start, right? And so I think by adding the names and being more inclusive, right, that's a place where we can start in our syllabus. But it's definitely not the end all be all and it's definitely not going to replace right those frameworks of knowledge that have come from colonialism and heteronormativity and hegemony and all these different things right these systems of oppression that work um, against us and for others correct. And so I think for me right when I think about my pedagogical processes, it is directly linked to um, critical pedagogy and so that is how do we take the knowledge that has been created and reshape it. And part of that is engaging with critical dialogue with students, with one another, with colleagues, with administration, and trying to find out where is power situated within this. Um, the Spark page that, that uh, you have access to on there, I have kind of broken down the process to this rapid type of acronym. Um, and this is, um, I think, easier for, for some to say than to actually do. And so first is you have to be reflexive. You have to look at your positionality, right? Who are you? What are you supposed to do? What is needed of you? What is asked of you? What is in your capability? What are your biases? How can you engage in this? And I think that's the first thing is that we kind of have to stop and think, what am I doing and why am I doing it, right? Um, and the second one is amplify. Amplify the voices of your students. Amplify the voices of your colleagues that are colleagues of color or from other marginalized identities. Um, amplify also the ways in which uh, you include the voices of different academic scholars, not just in your syllabus, but inviting them to come and speak in your classroom and also speak in uh, events at your institution, knowing right that they should also be getting compensation. So if you're not able to provide compensation, advocate for compensation for these individuals as well too. Be purposeful. Um, these past couple of months, including AEJMC, I have seen so many administrators and journal um, publishers um, and, and editors Every time they get a microphone in front of them, they're all about diversity and diversity and we need to do this and they have a problem over there, they have a problem over there and they don't actually do the work. So don't just talk about it, be about it, right? Start looking at the ways in which you can be purposeful and engaging. This work, as I mentioned before, is messy. Those scholars of color that are working in this know how messy this is and how laboring it is for, for all of us. And so this isn't just an easy kind of like, let me just cite a couple of black scholars and my work is done. That's, that's the place where you start, correct? But then be purposeful in, engaging with those, asking students to ask questions, asking them to go and look up those scholars, look at their identities, um, give them different types of assignments where they have to create different types of content around the material that you gave them. Bridge that with pop culture pedagogy. I mean, that's what I do, right? Go and look at, uh, at shows like um, One Day at a Time, shows like Pose, shows like Empire, shows that have these different types of representation and engage with them that, that uh, students are able to create not just knowledge, but also mediated content. It gives them an opportunity to practice and to put that knowledge to work. Be intersectionally inclusive with those different types of examples, right? Not just in terms of race, ethnicity, and gender, but also in ability and disability, right? LGBTQ and sexual orientations. Are you including pronouns? Are you including um, information on gender neutral bathrooms whenever you create your syllabi? Um, again, voices um, that are in your institution, and outside your institution, consult with them. If you're doing some kind of cultural work, right? don't make an assumption don't talk about the other group ask them about it engage with them ask them to talk about it but you want to consult and co-create knowledge as well too right um, co-author a manuscript uh, have a panel just like this right where there's other people engage with it and the most important part of this is decentering whiteness privilege and power that is so important and it's also I think one of the most difficult it's looking at your privilege and how are you able to um, take whiteness from being the center of everything the histories the motivations the intents the resources and taking that out and making it more multicultural right where everyone has an equal opportunity and access to not just the knowledge base right but an opportunity to create an opportunity to craft and, and you hear their voices and their stories. And sometimes that is, I think, a little difficult, especially given that we have a very specific class, maybe 50 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes, right, depending what it is. So again, right, going back and reflecting and being uh, purposeful and looking at this as an iterative process over and over, that is something that is happening in real time and responding to socio-political conditions, right, is a way to rework it. But I would say uh, to Chelsea and Jasmine who asked that question, right, is being able to engage with this critical work, engage with the scholars who are doing this work as well too, right, and collaborate and come together to make this happen. Nothing is gonna happen overnight. And it's something that has been, I think, slowly boiling and coming to a simmer, right, before it was simmering and now it's at this boil where 
people like, what do we do? And they want this easy fix, right? They're going to webinars, they're going to, to read and saying, how do I fix this instantly? It's, it's not going to happen instantly, right? It's, it's putting in the work. It's having these difficult dialogues, making people uncomfortable, make them uncomfortable, right? I think um, for, for faculty who are more from privileged identities, it's about saying, I'm going to use this identity and this privilege to help advocate for these other people, for my students, for my colleagues of color. And I think for those individuals who um, identify at those intersections of the marginalized identities, it's about to use John Lewis's uh, phrase, right? Getting in trouble, the good trouble, the trouble that is necessary, right? Because I think for a lot of us, we're at institutions where there's a lot of pushback. We're looking at trying to get tenure as well too. And we're trying to decenter our classroom. We're trying to decolonize the syllabus. We're trying to do all these different things at once. And so I think um, having those conversations with people who are your allies, not just allies, right? But are there in solidarity with you. They're not just gonna say I'm your ally. They're gonna actually advocate for you. They're gonna help you. They're gonna give you advice. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a lot to do. There's not just one simple answer to how do we do, right? It's where do we start? And starting is citing and being inclusive of the voices that have been marginalized and left on the margins for so, so long. And then start to engage that in the classroom, engage that with your students and with your co uh, colleagues and upwards to administration. Because even though we hear a lot of these calls to diversify and make equitable, right? Hire more faculty of color, uh, get more students in. We're in HSI, we've reached 25%. What does that mean if your administration is still so white? If your administration is still so cisgender and heteronormative, right? What does it mean when the people making the decisions aren't informed about the lived experiences of the people that are being most affected by those decisions? So it's a place to start. Um, and hopefully it's, it's this momentum is going to keep going and building and we can all come together and make this a more equitable, inclusive space um, as much as possible, right? Nathan, you've said a lot and, and I do want to make sure that we jump in and get one more question in related to one of the items in your uh, acronym, uh, A for Amplify, mm -hmm. it's in part about amplifying student voices. And one of our attendees wanted to know, how do you do that on your first day? Um, starting for us at the University of Alabama is one week from today. So we don't have quite as much time as you guys have at SDSU. What do you do on that first day? How do you communicate what you're going to do when it comes to being inclusive, when it comes to decentering de whiteness and, and privilege? Uh, maybe Kay, if you want to address that. I do actually, there's a, a brand new assignment that I started um, now this coming semester and um, I'll go ahead and show you uh, my Canvas um, course so that so you can kind of see how I set it up. Basically, I am sending every single student that is in any of my classes this semester to um, a diversity, inclusion, and belonging course that's hosted on LinkedIn. They don't even have to log in and it's um, a LinkedIn learning um, belonging uh, they call it dibs type of a course. And so um, it's about, I think, six hours, five to six hours um, worth of videos. And um, they're, actually, they're actually really interesting and helpful. And this makes sure that every single student that is coming into my classroom before they even get there, because this is due at the start of the very first class in true Sweetser style, um, that they have already underwent the beginning of the training and we're all at the same foundation. And then from there, we can start to do some of the great things that um, Nate has been talking about. So, um, for example, another thing that I do with my students is um, on my Canvas class is I will have um, every, uh, every time I am assigning a um, black scholar, and, and it's actually all of the scholars um, in the readings, I'm now showing the pictures of those scholars. Because when you look at someone's name, can you always tell the race? Um, I don't go to conferences, and that was one of my, my big problems this summer. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't know who the black scholars are, who the Latinx scholars are, and, and I don't go to conferences, and so I don't get an opportunity um, to know just by looking at a name that that person um, is someone that I should include in my course to create this, um, uh, this role model um, exchange for my students. And so I would encourage you to show faces in your classes as well as in your Canvas courses. And so um, every time I assign a reading, just because of the way that I set up my course management system, there's a page that says you have to do this reading. Um, and so this semester I will now have, um, I went through and um, downloaded all the pictures of all the scholars that I could find um, 
for all of the readings and now the students will have an opportunity to see that representation there and then um, another example is uh, this great idea that um, I'm going to tell you, I got it from um, Dr. Tia Tyree at Howard. She um, and then uh, Candace did a fantastic webinar for IPR um, a little while ago, like, uh, I mean, COVID time. It was probably last week, but it felt like three weeks ago. But in there, she said, hey, professors, use your power for good. You know, just like Nate was talking about, um, I get to pick clients in my class. And so why wouldn't I pick a, um, you know, a small black business owner um, and, and make that the client who gets the pro bono work? Or um, maybe instead of saying, you know, write a, a post um, event press release on on this event. Maybe I specify an event that's a cultural event, which will cause the student um, to learn a little bit more about that culture and and try to um, you know think about the right ways to communicate and also introduce um, some cultural sensitivity in there. Um, so that was kind of a, a couple of more tips that were a little bit all over the place um, for you, um, but. Um, from, from my perspective, um, that's how I'm trying to enact all of those um, amazingly inspirational things that Dr. Nate is talking about is um, to, to think how can I be creative um, to put this um, in front of the students in those very um, you know, overt ways as well as the subtle ways which, which show that this is a part of just what we do now. Dr. Parrish, uh, some of our audience members want to know, what are your thoughts about some of the things you've been hearing this last 20, 20 minutes or so? Kind of maybe pick up that role as discussant and give us some of your thoughts on what you're hearing. You're I'm on mute. So um, thank you so much. First of all, Nathan, you are like killing the game. You've got the models, you've got it all. So you need to make sure that you don't just leave this discussion with your notes. You need to also go back and reference what he has taken his time and what also uh, Dr. Sweetster has taken her time to put together all these things for you. So make sure that you circle back and don't just bombard their inboxes with questions. Also, I mean, just make sure you look first. Um, there's a lot of content there's a lot of goodness that even I will be utilizing. Um, I think a lot of great things were said. I saw some of the questions that were populating about how can we make this a uh, something beyond just citing. And um, there's a quote from a song. I don't even know when this song was, but it says, ain't nothing to it but to do it. And I just think we have to embody that right now. <laughs> we just have to do it, infuse it into everything that you do. Use Nathan's uh, model. Um, anytime you're about to do a new endeavor for your class, think about how you can infuse diversity into that. Think about um, how you can use that list that the Broom Center has to have uh, guest lectures and also people on your syllabi. I mean, you've just got to include it in your world just as you do everything else um, that, you know, you choose to endeavor or change in your life. And I, I don't think it it's simple and complex at the same time, but as many people said on this um, webinar, there's a starting point and the starting point is you know with the points that people have raised and with the platforms that people have showed you and with the databases that people have organized on this call already thank you for sharing i'm going to go back into the chat and this is a question from michelle um and the question is is there good language to use when encouraging and this interestingly enough this person teaches music business. Um, so I think that that speaks to the uh, interest uh, across various disciplines. Um, and Michelle asks, is there good language to use when encouraging students to make choices that might expand the opportunity to learn? And this gets to the language messaging. Nate, I'm going to go to you for that question, and then we'll come back and, and get Kay's take. Yeah, so I think for me, 
you find out the language that your students are learning by listening. We as academics do one thing well, and that's talk, myself included, right? We talk, 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 but listen, right? On that first day of school, that first day of class, when you come in there, ask them to introduce themselves. I have my students do a positionality video where they sit in front of YouTube and they tell me about their positionality, right? Who they are, what is their intersectional identities, what are tied to oppressions, what are tied to opportunities, what makes them them. But then as you start, to, I also make them do reflections throughout the, the semester, right? Because writing is such a great exercise that a lot of people don't incorporate. Even in music business, I think writing is something that is so important because as, as students listen and start to write, they start to reflect because they're like, how am I going to meet this page limit? Or what am I going to write about? So they start to, to, to reflect. And I think a lot of the, the, the things that I found out about my students came from the reflections, came from class discussions, came from smaller group discussions. I'm a really big uh, proponent for team-based pedagogy as well too, right? Putting students in smaller groups to talk about things and sharing to the larger classroom. Um, it helps students um, who are first generation, students who are not used to talking, I think help develop what they're talking about and then say it out loud. So just by listening, right? And finding out what it is about them and then meeting them where they're at, right? Maybe they want to talk about Pose. Maybe they want to talk about RuPaul's Drag Race. Maybe they want to talk about um, uh, Kamala Harris being the vice president candidate, right? How can you incorporate that in there, right? These are things that I think you have to meet them at where they're at. And that's why it's so important for your syllabus to be living, for you to be reflexive and attentive, right? So that you can say, oh, this is what they're talking about. This is what matters to them. How can I, as an educator, find out what's happening, right? Um, you said music business, right? Right now, there's a lot of conversation happening over Cardi B and Megan Stallion's song WAP. Why is it okay for men to say that, but not okay for women to say that? What does it mean for Cardi as a business? Look at her interview with four other women that are uh, identify as black at, at, at Apple Music and how they're talking about, right? That they're not just about singing, but they also have a business. They're in there about making money and who they are and what they're doing. So what can you find that students are already talking about? Meet them there and then bridge that gap for them. Yes, it takes a little bit of extra work on your part, but again, that's what we're here for, right? We're, we're definitely not in it for the money, I can tell you that. I love that conversation um, and I love that it starts with listening. Um, I think that, you know, because I basically hang on every word that Dr. Nate says, um, he, he is a perfect um, person all around and I just could listen to him all day. And so building on an earlier comment that he made, um, it's about also, you know, using your position within the classroom of being the professor and providing that leadership. Um, and so, you know, we are leaders and have to model forward what we are expecting from our students. And so I also think that, um, you know, you'd be surprised. I mean, I'm in California, um, you know, we, we all drink, uh, you know, juice and, um, you know, kale for lunch. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are some people that make some comments in classes that are not very progressive, right? And so it takes us as professors to stand our ground and, and to not be scared in that moment um, and to be a little bit vulnerable and to push back on things that, um, that you need to push back on. And so, um, you know, if there's a comment that before is just kind of like, well, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't overt in what that person was saying in, in that it was demeaning or it was this or that, whatever the case may be. I mean, you, you now have to, um, be that leader and showcase how you can push back. And I'm not saying that, you know, like you, you go after uh, and attack students verbally, um, but, you know, showcase for them the ways that they can stand um, in respectful ways to tell people what you said is not appropriate. And, um, you know, people don't talk like that anymore and they never should have in the first place because chances are they didn't just come up with these ideas in their head, it came from home. And so we have to un, uh, teach that, um, have them unlearn that, and then they need to go into their homes and they need to push back on their families um, because that's one of the hardest things. When your family says something that is inappropriate, can you push back? So especially in public relations where words matter more than anything, I have to show them the right words to use and how to be caring, but yet strong in what is expected. You own the classroom. One of the points that Nate made earlier was the, how he uses memes in the classrooms. I'd like to go back to that point because I think it's an important one with regards to rethinking how pedagogy works. Nate, uh, let's talk about what you do there in the classroom. 
Yeah, so memes are important, I think, because students are participating in knowledge creation, right? That's where they are at. And again, we meet them where they're at. And so when students are reading pieces in my class, I start them off with pieces on positionality. We also talk about intersectionality and how it's not just a buzzword and just intersection of identities, but the oppressions that come with it. We talk about misogyny, homophobia, masculinity, issues of masculinity in media. And then I give them an opportunity to go and find different types of pop culture images or images that have already been used for memes before and make their own meme that talk about it directly. So this is giving them an exercise to be able to, again, bridge right what they've read theoretically in the class academically with what is happening in the real world. And they present it to one another. And of course they laugh, um, but it gives them an opportunity, right? To think critically, to create, and then also to think about why is that funny? And why is that not funny? Because again, right, when we talk about issues of racism, misogyny, homophobia, and so forth, a lot of people will say, oh, it's just a joke or it's funny. I didn't really mean it. And so what does that mean for them, right? How do we, how do we come to a place where we are speaking about media being a place that has become complacent, where people just kind of brush it off because, oh, it's just funny. Let's just laugh at it, right? So I think it's doing a lot of different things at one time. I do it for my media and sexuality class. I did it in my Selena class. Um, I'm gonna be instigating it more in different other classes, but it's a really quick and easy way for you to take any class that you're doing, whatever the discipline is, and be able to get them to actually create knowledge um, and think critically about stuff and ask questions. Because through that meme, they're also gonna be challenging if it's counter, uh, counter, counter heteronormative, counter misogynistic, counter whatever, they're also gonna be challenging asking questions, which is all part of critical pedagogy, right? Bringing this new sense of, uh, of awareness um, and being conscious about the, the, the media that you're creating and what does that mean for people who are consuming it. Great point. I also agree with um, the memes, if I can chime in for a second. Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, when I first started um, teaching in 2016 as an assistant professor, I introduced memes into the classroom and I did it as a means of trying to meet students where they are and then it turned into so much more. Um, for all the reasons that Nathan just said, and also just for lightening the mood a little bit around difficult discussions um, and making them feel comfortable. They know how to create memes. They do this all the time, right? There's so many ways for them to do so. It made the discussions about difficult things comfortable, and it also made them feel like they had ownership in the discussion um, and they also were empowered about how to create memes um, for different contexts um, and, and um, I guess different types of um, content and cultural backgrounds and things like that. So I think memes are a great way. Any like digital platform that they're using, grab it, look into it, figure out how you can bring it into the classroom because it's gonna be great. Those discussions about diversity, equity, inclusion are already happening on those platforms. Even TikTok, my goodness, um, a dance platform or whatever it is. There's a lot of discussion about diversity, culture, and race with that. So whatever they're using, I would say grab it, explore it, and bring it into the classroom so that you all can pick it apart and put it back together as a group. Candice, may I ask you a, a question as well too? Yeah. Um, do you feel, because sometimes I feel this way, that also when you have students create memes, it decenters you as a center and puts it on them, where when we're having these difficult conversations, dialogues, it's the students then, and you're basically a facilitator rather than telling them what to think? Absolutely. And then I can sit in the crowd <laughs> and laugh <laughs> right with them. So absolutely. It gives them that agency, like they are the owner they are creating. Great point. Um, go in, try it, use it, uh, because our students are. Um, next question, and this comes from Faye, um, and she teaches uh, research methods in advertising and PR, and her question is, do you have any idea to, uh, any ideas to include diversity relevant assignments or activities? Kay, let's uh, have you take that question. Yeah, I teach research methods um, on every level, and it is a passion of mine. Um, so, I mean, I have so many ideas, I, I don't even think I can get them all into the time we have left. Um, you know, you could uh, just have a conversation about what do we ask on a survey? Um, how do we ask gender 
Um, you know, I am always sending my survey questions to Nate when it comes to, to demographics. And I'm like, is this what I'm supposed to say? What, how does this look, you know, look? And I don't want to offend anybody. And so even just going through basic demographics and how we're asking people to describe themselves and maybe rather than, you know, clicking a radio button, now they are going to fill in a blank um, will we'll create that opportunity for you to talk about these issues um, and for, for you to talk about it's not your place to assign something to someone um, and let those folks assign it for themselves, um, but still collect the data you need. Um, you can look at uh, issues that, that delve into, um, you know, some of the, the um, uh, diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging, um, you know, type questionnaires. Uh, maybe you want to take on a client where you're doing a, an, an HR kind of a survey to find out how much belonging there is um, within that organization. Or maybe you want to do a content analysis to, um, you know, showcase uh, just commercials um, on the major primetime networks or um, the characters that are in shows um, and, and, you know, kind of get at um, this idea that it has been predominantly, you know, Oscar's so white, um, that is an issue, right? And so you're, um, you're showcasing that through, through their own um, uh, learning and kind of coming to that with the data. Um, you know, again, supporting a, um, uh, a black business um, and doing research for them as a client. I mean, I could just go on and on and on, but I feel like I should shut up. So um, I'll, uh, I'll throw it over uh, to some of my, uh, my qualitative peeps and see how they feel um, about that as well. It's funny that you said qualitative peeps because Kay already knows that I'm all about qualitative research. And I think that there's a lot of uh, people out there, a lot of academics that are doing research in, in qualitative and quantitative spaces with um, marginalized populations. So again, looking at what they're writing, how are they doing that kind of research? Because when you're training future researchers, right, it's not just about what are the right statistics to use and what are the right methods, but how do you ask those sensitive questions? How do you work with those populations, especially if you're doing an ethnography or interviews? Um, I can think off the top of my head, Natalie Tyndall and Erica Sizek, who are doing really great work at, with marginalized populations and finding ways to take these methods, right, and, and apply them in very meaningful, purposeful ways that don't exploit right, marginalized populations, but instead do work that helps them, right, that also helps amplify their voices and not just uses it to get tenure or to get a publication. So I think looking at the diverse array of scholars that we have out there that are doing that work, and unfortunately, we have to sometimes look outside of the journalism and media studies um, journals because they're not being published there. So another thing to do is kind of poke at editors, if you're on the editorial board, right, say, hey, how come these voices are not getting published in Mass Common Society, in PR journals, right? Why are they having to go to these journals on the fringes? Not saying that they're bad journals, right? But when we're working in a tenure track position to try to cite, right, and get published in premier journals to get tenure, it then becomes something that is imperative to all of our, our futures as well, too, to kind of be uh, creating knowledge and, and amplifying the knowledge of each other in these journalism and, and media study centric journals as well. I think you raise a good point about asking questions. That's part of what we do. I'm going to go back to uh, a question in the chat, and this is from Aja, and I uh, apologize if I'm mispronouncing your uh, first name. And the question is, what are your thoughts on keeping problematic scholars on your syllabi? Um, this person is in hard, art history, and Heidegger, uh, the, a Nazi sympathizer, is cited as an example. Can you um, like that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it because um, I, actually anytime I say uh, the words Nazi or white supremacist um, in my classes, I always cringe. Um, but it's followed with uh, some expletives about how they're horrible people. Um, so I use that as an opportunity to say, you know, you can't be like that. Those, those are, they're not contributing anything to this world. And in fact, they're hurting people. Um, and so um, I think, you know, Nate will probably have some really good ideas about, um, you know, cancel culture um, and that idea. 
Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, so I don't know um, that world in art and, and that particular, uh, what I'm assuming is a seminal piece. Um, but, but a lot of the seminal um, work and some of the theories that I work in um, are, um, you know, old white men and they were old white men when they uh, created the research um, and they're even older white men now. So um, I still have them on my syllabus, but I have now added in contemporary work um, to show how we have evolved, but we still haven't evolved enough. Um, when it does come to someone, if there, I don't know of anybody, thankfully, I don't know of anybody in uh, mass comm um, uh, who is um, a horrible racist or Nazi or, you know, um, just a horrible person. Um, so if there were, and the, and the work was seminal, uh, and I felt kind of needed to be taught, it would become a uh, conversation into the, okay, this is what this person found, but all of that work is almost undone because of the horrible thoughts in life that this person lived. Um, so I would use it as a transitional conversation um, if it was good work. Again, I, I don't know. Um, but I think Nate might have some really good things to say kind of about uh, cancel culture on that. So cancel culture is so different, I think, when you think about it in terms of like academics versus entertainment celebrities. And so I think that's that's important to differentiate where that cancel culture is happening, right? I think we hear it a lot as a buzzword it with celebrities who tweeted something 15 years ago and now they've changed their mind. And how do we in, in expect people to grow and challenge them if we're not going to meet them and, and help them, right? But I think when it comes to ac probably the word that this in individual used, right, problematic um, academics, it's, I think it's important to bring them to, to mind and talk about them as an example and ask students, how do you react to this? Does it make, well, how does it make you feel? What are you going to do about it? What can you take from the um, academic tool set that you have now to be able to craft a message that counters that, to be able to find out what are we going forward? Because I think it's important, right, for us to acknowledge that we are where we're at, not because we're in a vacuum, right? When we talk about all these different oppressions and opportunities we have, they're systemic. And these things are permeated from the very top all the way to the very bottom, right? They're coming at us. And now, especially, we're at such a pivotal moment in history where we have, right, we, we talk about all these things about Nazi and, and the canon from the past. Well, it's happening now. And there's academics that are doing it now. I can't tell you how many news stories I've seen of teachers and professors who on their private social media pages have nooses that they're out there and they're like, oh, well, that doesn't mean anything because I'm teaching. And so I think it's, it's important to address it, but then have students find ways that they're gonna combat that. How can we fix that using um, the, the discipline that you're within? And so for me, I think it's important to acknowledge it, but also to say, how are we gonna combat that? And why is it important to combat that? What does it mean to the audiences that are viewing it or listening to it? And what does it say about the people that are producing this content um, in terms of not just academic literature, but also media at large? Dorothy, you're muted. Dorothy, you're on mute. Um, our, the hour has uh, flown by. Um, and one of the things that I see in the chat uh, has to do with the power structure and capitalism and the marginalization um, of um, academics of color. Um, what suggestions do you two have, aside from all the great resources that you share today, that you'd like to end on? You have to be a mentor and you have to be a friend. I, we all came into this, um, this uh, vocation because we want to help people be the best that they can be and we want to share um, our experiences to help make them better. And so um, if you see a colleague that is being marginalized, um, then you need to stand up for that colleague. Um, when you see a student from a community of color um, that you know isn't really sure where he or she is going, um, then find ways to create pathways for that, that student. For example, the Broom Center paid for six PRSSA to PRSA memberships um, for students in the class of 2020 from um, HBCUs and HSIs, um, because we want to grow fantastic professionals that don't all look like me. And so I think it's that allyship and really just remembering why we're in it. We're, we're in it to mentor. And that's, that's what I'll close with. Thank you, Nate. Last words. 
from my perspective, right? Look at your intersectionalities, check your biases, reflect, reflect, reflect. Everyone has oppressions, but you also have privileges. I identify as brown and queer, but I also know that I have male privilege in a lot of different spaces, right? So how can I use those privileges to help others? And as an academic, a queer academic of color, right? Looking for those mentors that I can find that are gonna give me opportunities, that are gonna give me good advice. And it may not be in your department. It may be outside your entire university system. Look on social media for groups that you can be part of. I'm a member of the MAC division very purposefully, right? Because that is a place in AJMC where people of color come together to talk about scholarship. I'm part of the LGBTQ group um, in, in AJMC because again, right, you have this solidarity. So find people who, yes, want to be your allies, but more importantly, are gonna stand in solidarity with you and are gonna help you, amplify you and hold you up. Thank you. Uh, you both have done it. The, the entire panel has been fascinating. I want to say I hope that what has been said today sparks an ongoing conversation, dialogue, but more importantly, action um, in your various academic units. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you so much, Dr. Dorothy Bland. Thank you, Dr. Bland, Dr. Parrish, uh, Daniel, yeah. and Dr. Nate. Uh, you guys have really energized me. Have a great day. Happy fall. Bye.